Om Namo Narayanaya. This is a recording of a talk of James Swartz on the Bhagavad Gita at Yoga Vidya Bad Meinberg near Hanover in Germany. Me in all beings and sees all beings in me is me. In other words, you're only just seeing yourself. The self realizes the self. <laughs> the self realizes the self, not you. <laughs> The jiva doesn't realize the self, the self realizes the self. That's what it means. But can't, it can only be that way, can't it? Because there's not two selves, is there? <clears throat> Reality's non dual, there's only one self, so huh? there can't be anybody to realize the self but the self, and that's really weird, isn't it? Because the self's already realized. The self already knows what it is, but what? But Maya makes it think that it doesn't know what it is. That's why we can, that's why you can get self-realized. Because you're always just the self, it's just a thought. The self is always the self, and you're always the self, and you're always realized. But what? Maya makes you, fools you into thinking you're not the self. Yeah. So that's, that's a pretty simple problem. All we have to do is get rid of the thought. Can't, there can't be anybody else. To, that's why you can't go to the self, because what, there's nobody else to go there. There's only one self. See the logic? Always, always keep this. I non. Always try to think from this platform. What does this platform mean? What the reality is non-dual. There's nothing other than me. There's only one consciousness, and I'm it. And if if that should be the bedrock basis of all your thinking, you can keep that in your mind all the time. That's called keeping meditating on the self. <laughs> That's keeping that knowledge in mind. Or other, I'm whole and complete. Nothing's missing. When you have desires, then that's a good teaching. I'm whole and I'm complete. Nothing's missing. You dismiss the desire right away. Right? I, weapons cannot cleave it. Water cannot wet it. Fire cannot burn it. That's a good one. Fire cannot burn me. Why not? Now that's your fears. When your fears come up, right? Chant that little mantra from the Gita. Huh? Dismiss those those thoughts. They're just thoughts, but you don't want to believe them. You need, but you need this opposite thought to what to destroy that thought, those thoughts. So this is just what thinking from the self's point of view until you've removed the last doubt that you have about who you are. This vision remains no matter what you do. Why? Because the the object of the thought is you. And when are you not present? Can anybody tell me when they're not present? Good. Nobody's raising their hands. That means you know you're the self, doesn't it? If Because uh, that, that, that only applies to the self, because the self is the only thing that's not present. So you're all obviously the self. Otherwise you'd object, wouldn't you? You'd say, no, I'm not present in deep sleep. Why don't you say that? Well, you don't say that because you're all yanis. You're all enlightened. You know very well you're present in deep sleep. You know the I that's not present in deep sleep is what? The waking entity, isn't it? Right? You're present in deep sleep. Of course you are. I got a whole class full of yanis, lightened people. <laughs> well, you got to argue with me. Nobody's arguing. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Arjuna said, "Oh, <laughs> Arjuna said, my mind is a mess." <laughs> <laughs> My mind is a mess, and I don't see this yoga of non-duality you speak of. <laughs> huh? Yeah. 
uh, Krishna said, the mind is nothing but agitation. Uh, ad Krishna, uh, no, he says, the mind is nothing but agitation, Krishna, an entrenched tyrant. That means a bad boss, just beating him. It's impossible to control. And Krishna is very kind. He says, he says yes, yes, yo, it's true. Yoga, the yoga, he means the yoga of non-duality. He doesn't mean karma yoga here. He means uh, thinking, uh, understanding you're, that you're the self. That yoga is difficult. Now that's a yoga. We have a great sage in our tradition called Bhadarayana, and he calls Vedanta the yoga of no contact. Because yoga means contact, right? Yoga means to contact. It means to join, to connect, to obtain, to get something. That's the meaning of yoga, to yoke, to join two things. But he says Vedanta is the yoga of no contact. Well, obviously, well, obviously it's no contact because there's not two things to join, is there? Mm -hmm. Huh? No way, you, huh? There's no, there's, the jiva is not going to join with this. The jiva is this already. So he says, so. he says, yes, it is difficult, Krishna replied, if the mind is not mastered by what? Repeated practice and objectivity. In the objectivity means looking at things from what? Ishwara's point of view. And that means understanding Maya, understanding Ishwara, understanding Shiva, and understanding Jagat, the world. That's all we got. Those are the four basic principles operating here. And now Arjuna is having a little, a little self-esteem problem here. Uh, we said here you need the self-confidence. Huh? That's the for meditation to work. You really need to be self-confident. And Arjuna is not too self-confident here. So he asked a really kind of silly question. And uh, and Krishna gives him a rather a rather stupid answer, I think, but that's just my opinion. Then Arjuna and I'll tell you why I think it's stupid, okay? After we read it. Then Arjuna said, What happens to me if I have faith in the scriptures? but I'm unsuccessful keeping my mind fixed on the self. Am I not lost if I can neither understand who I am through self-knowledge or, uh, self or am unable to keep my mind fixed on the self? You are the only one that can eliminate this doubt. He's having a, he's having a little doubt about this. You are not lost, O Arjuna, because anyone who performs action for yoga never reaches a bad end. Such people go, he means after death. That's what he means here, Arjuna says. What if he does all this? He's a, he's a rajasic person. Rajasic person, are always, they're always trying to figure out what's in it for them. Huh? The Rajasic people, huh? That they're, they're all they're self-centered people. What what's in it for? That's a business mind. Your business people, those are Rajasic people. They're always thinking, "What's in it for me?" So he's thinking, "Jesus Christ! If I work my butt off for years and years and years, and then I die and I don't get moksha, what's the point?" <laughs> right. Why should I invest all of this time and effort on something that's obviously so difficult and I don't succeed, then what? I might as well just keep doing what I'm doing. This, this, does, this doesn't seem like a good business proposition. <laughs> I'm not sure I want to invest in this project. So Krishna gives him. The answer is, what else have you got to do? That's the actual answer. You're stuck when you hear about this. There really isn't any other option. 
you once you hear about the self and once you've had a taste of it, you can't go back. There's nothing else for you to do. Your 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 goose is cooked. You might as well just go right through the end. Huh? You just it's, it's it's too exciting. It's too alluring. You know. So you're you're never lost. You uh, you'll keep going. I imagine most of you people here in this room have been uh, seeking for a long time. Probably most of you have been seeking since you were children. When you really get back and think about it. You've always been interested in knowledge and knowing the truth. Isn't that right? Huh? Yeah. You may have chased various experiences, but you're always wanting to know what's up, what's happening. Please, I want to figure this out. Your your parents probably hated you. Because <laughs> you wouldn't accept anything. Right? You always, what about this? I don't know. And you're always questioning, always doubting, always thinking. That's inquiry. So once you've been bitten by that, you, you can't really go back. But he's having a little set doubt because he hears, he sees, you know, he sees his own mind now. He's with Krishna and he sees how disturbed he is. Krishna is just this ocean of peace. Right in the middle of the battlefield, Krishna is not worried. Krishna doesn't care if he lives or dies. He's an enlightened person. He, in fact, he's an avatar. He So he knows he's you know who he is and he knows he doesn't live or doesn't die so if an arrow hits him it's all the same so he's totally peaceful and he doesn't have to kill anybody he's already said you can have my army but you and I, he said i won't fight but i'll be on your side he says i'm not going to fight and so but he's totally peaceful so arjuna can see and then his krishna's talking telling him this about this this non-duality in this meditation this yoga uh, he sees how disturbed his mind is he says so jesus he says i i don't know i don't think i'm up to this this is too much my mind is just a total mess yeah. and he loses he loses his heart here his confidence here so then he uh a christian gives him this answer he says you are not lost O arjuna because anyone who performs actions for yoga never reaches a bad end. Such people, speaking afterwards at the end, such people, I, I've fixed the translation here a little bit to make it more interesting. He said, such people go to the world where such people go. Now, who knows where you go after you die? The scripture says you go to some locus and this and that, but nobody really knows. I mean, and who cares anyway? Is anybody really worried about where they're going after they died? Is anybody in this room? Yeah, that's what I thought. Nobody's ever told me they're worrying about what, where they're going to go after they die. Huh? So what does it matter? <laughs> it only matters what happens right now here, doesn't it? It only matters what I'm doing here now. Who cares what's going to happen then? Nobody knows anyway. And even if the scripture says you go to heaven, so what's heaven? What does that mean? They don't tell you what it's like. Hmm? They don't, you know, they don't tell you what it's like. The story is, there was this man and this woman. They were, uh, they loved each other a lot, but they really liked sex. They were really nuts about sex. So they just had sex all the time. And they agreed that they agreed that if if uh, if one of them died before the other one, they that they somehow communicate from heaven because they were sure that in heaven they were told anyway that you could have as much sex as you want, and it was really it was all pleasure in heaven. And they figured, well, you probably get to choose your pleasure there, and since their pleasure was sex, they they. When they'd meet in heaven, then they'd have sex all the time. <laughs> that's what they wanted. They, they loved it. So. so the man dies. And uh, the woman is, you know, she's obviously a little unhappy. 
But one day she feels this presence in the room. And the and she said, Is that you, John? And the voice comes from the Yes, that's me. <laughs> she said, Jesus, how's your life? How is it there? And he says, oh, it's great. It's really great. He says, I, I, I get out of bed and I have sex. I have a, I have a, can I um, eat my breakfast and then I have more sex? <laughs> All morning I have sex and I eat lunch. I have some more sex in the afternoon. I have my dinner and then I have sex in the evening. It's just great. She says, just, he says, well, where are you? He said, oh, I'm a rabbit in Arizona. <laughs> Who knows where you go, huh? Come on. <laughs> Such people go to the world where such people go. <laughs> and, and and enjoy whatever your Boston is uh, until they're reborn into until what they are reborn into families of cultured people committed to Dharma or they're born into a family of wise yogis such a birth is difficult to gain in this world in the new life, the vastness from your previous efforts at yoga will sprout, and you'll strive for success in yoga once more. The momentum from your previous practice will carry you smoothly along, just as someone who sees the limitations of ritualism is led to self-knowledge. If you persevere in your practice, your mind will become pure and you will eventually realize the self. A yogi is superior to those who live a life of meditation. <coughs> so it means what? Dualistic meditation. Meditation on the forms of Ishwara. Here he means by a yogi, he means someone with non-dual vision. Superior to the scholars, in other words, to the book people, the people who just read about the self, but don't discriminate and superior to those who perform action, in other words, doers or karma yogis. Therefore, O Arjuna, be a yogi. The one who has faith and whose mind is absorbed in me is the most exalted yogi. This is my vision. Now, this is an interesting, uh, this is an interesting verse for, for this reason. Uh, I mean, apart from the fact that the person that he's talking to right there is not going to be the same Arjuna in the next life, in the next birth. Huh? Arjuna, is that right? Understand? The Arjuna that he's talking to there is not going to be the same Arjuna the next birth. Only the Vasanas uh, are going to move to the next birth. Actually, the next the Vasanas are not going to move anywhere. The Vasanas are going to attract the next body and generate the next body right in the, in, the, in the moment, in the present. There's not going to be any movement of the Vasanas, but let's assume, we'll just pretend that time and space are real. And, and So the Vasana bundle is going to, what, transmigrate. That's called transmigration. It's going to move from this jiva to this body to that body. The, the vasana bundle, which is the jiva, basically, that jiva uh, needs a body to work, keep working out its karma. It's no good. Uh, you can't work out your karma in other planes. You have to need a physical body to work out your karma. So you don't work out any karma in between incarnations. You you huh? you only experience pleasure and pain, and then what? You come back, and and when the the pleasure or the pain, the punya or the papa, 
that's a result of your karma, right, is exhausted in one of those planes, then you reincarnate and come back to physical body and you start to work out your, your karma again. So, so the same Arjuna is not going to be there. What's it going to be? The same Vasana bundle will be there. It'll be what? A physical body that's suited to the that particular Vasana bundle. But the person, person is going to be different. The personality is going to be different, isn't it? Because you've got a different time and you've got different place, different circumstances and a different time. So you're going to have a different location. You're going to have different parents. Everything's going to be different. So the way that Vasana bundle interacts with the new time and place is going to generate a new person. So that person won't be called Arjuna anymore. Yet Krishna is talking to him as if he's, as if that same Arjuna was going to be there. Obviously, Krishna knows better, but what is it? So, why is he telling this to Arjuna? To give him a little faith, to encourage him. That's one of the roles that a guru has. A guru is meant to like inspire you and encourage you. When you get lose your self confidence a little bit, say, No, no, take it easy. Come on. Keep trying. No problem. Nothing's lost. Daddy, daddy, daddy. That's like fairly psychological massaging here that, that Krishna's doing on Arjuna. But then he says in the last uh, verse, he says, very interesting. He says, therefore, be a yogi, or therefore, O Arjuna, be a yogi. What's, what's, why is that interesting? Because uh, he's giving Arjuna a new identity, not the self-identity. He's tried to give him the identity of the self. He's told him, you, you know, who he is. He's explained who you are. But that identity didn't work for Arjuna, did it? If, uh, if that identity worked, then he'd stop crying, he'd stop whining and complaining, he'd get up and do his job. He'd know nobody, he wasn't going to kill anybody and nobody was going to die at his hand. That Ishwara was doing everything. The whole thing was a, a, a dream only. It was a dream world here, and it was dream living beings and dream death, and he would just go, go through the actions, the dream actions, that create what? The dream war, and that would be the end of it, and no problem. And if his body died, it would be fine, and if their bodies died, it would be fine, and if nobody died, it would be fine, and everything is fine. But he, that's, that's not what happens. He just remains this emotional guy, like getting this knowledge. And so he's going to need, and being Arjuna the warrior isn't working all that well for him, is it? He needs a new identity, so Krishna's given him a new identity. He says, be a yogi. There's a good identity for you. That, huh? So this is a stage where, where you, you, you take an identity as what? As a seeker, as a yogi. It means an inquirer. You look at yourself differently, not as a karmi, not as a doer in this world trying to gain something, but as a yogi, what? Trying to know who he or she is. So there's a shift of his relative identity. He's shifting the jiva off of the, what? Off of this worldly situation, he's going to shift the jiva to what? To the subjective situation, to understanding who he is. Chapter 7. <clears throat> direct and indirect knowledge. We can get this out of the way right, right away. We already did. The self exists. Is that direct or indirect knowledge? Indirect. I am the self. Direct or indirect? Direct. I am... Huh? The self-exist implies what? It implies separation, doesn't it? It implies that, that to, to get to this self, I've got to move, go from here to here, because the self isn't here. I am the self. Does that imply any action? Is any action implied 
by that statement, I am the self? No. So to understand the meaning of that, what 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 has to happen? I just have to understand the meaning. I don't have to do anything at all. So what we're doing is explaining to you what it means to be the self. Now you all have indirect knowledge, for sure. Does anybody know, does anybody not think that there's a self? Does anybody think there's no self? in this room. Good. Because <laughs> if you, there is somebody, I don't know why you're sitting here. <laughs> so the only question is, huh, then the only question is, and, and does anybody know that the self is, does anybody think that the self is not uh, limitless, non-dual, actionless, ordinary, ever-present, unconcerned, consciousness, awareness. Does anybody think it's not that? No, evidently everybody thinks it's, that's what it is. Okay, so you, you've all got self-knowledge, right? Everybody's got self-knowledge here. Well, now, now, then what's left? What does it mean to say, I am limitless, ordinary, actionless, non-dual, uncreated, ever-present, unconcerned, awareness consciousness? What does it mean to say that in terms of what? My life here is a jiva. That's the context in which I'm making this statement. Right? What does it mean? Well, that's what we're explaining to you, what it means. You've all got self-knowledge. Nobody has a doubt that the self exists. Nobody doubts what it is. Then the only other issue is what does it mean huh, to this jiva here when, what that knowledge means, and that's what our scripture is. It's explaining to you what it means. So, and once it's clear what it means, then no, problem solved. And if it's not clear, then what? A little more reflection is required. Then the next stage of our sadhana, of our practice, is required. Then that's called reflection. I need to, once you understand, you're told what it means, if you still don't aren't clear about what it means, then you have to do the next stage of the sadhana. The next stage is called manana. This stage is called shravana. Shravana means hearing. You hear it and you get the knowledge. Once you got the knowledge, there's no new knowledge. There's no point in going back and trying to find out something else. You already know it. So then once you understand what it means, if you can't accept that, or that doesn't make sense, then what do you do? Then you reflect on it. Then you look at what you think and feel in light of what it means huh, until you do understand it. And if they're clear and you've removed all your doubts about what it means, and you still don't feel free and happy, then you go to the third stage of Vedanta sadhana. That's called Nididhyasana. There you go back and requalify. <laughs> you got no doubts. You're clear about what it means. You know your awareness. Everything's fine there. But I don't experience what? The freedom. Or I experience the freedom intermittently. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't then that means what? There's some subjective obstacle, we call them a pratibandhika. There's a, some deep samskara or vasana that hasn't been addressed yet. So then I just go back to the drawing board, I keep doing my shravana, I keep doing my manana, and I keep doing my yoga, my karma yoga, 
and so forth and so on. And there are a whole, whole series of practices that are that are will requalify me until what that old samskara is gone. And then you'll get you've got the knowledge and you have no doubts about it. But then what? You'll get the result, which is what tripti means satisfaction. You'll be completely satisfied with yourself. And that's the end of it from that point on. So, so now we're just explaining to it what it means. So you got it here, clear. Direct knowledge is what? I am awareness. And a- actually all you need is that. Uh, Nisargadatta, how many read I am that? Yeah, well, almost everybody in the room read I am that. That's all he did, right? That was it. That was all he needed. He, I guess he was a couple of years. He said he had total faith that what the guru said was true, that he was consciousness. And so he just kept thinking only that thought until what he was clear of what that meant, that he was, wasn't Nisargadatta, that he was actually consciousness. So you actually don't, you know, if you're, if you have that kind of burning desire to know and you have complete faith in the teaching, then, then all you need is one thought, basically. But having said that, it doesn't, ha- doesn't hurt to have, have all of these other weapons in your arsenal. Your, uh, all these other prakriyas, we call them prakriyas, or methods or means of discriminating what your jiva from yourself, from the apparent self to the real self, discriminating the reflection from the original consciousness of which you, the jiva, is a reflection. So, so directing in now, with this chapter seven, we start a whole new section of the Gita. The first part, the first six chapters, the, the, the Gita is set up based upon a famous mantra, Tat Twam Asi. You, have you heard that? Tat Twam Asi? Those, that's a mantra. That's called a Mahavakya. Mahavakya. Maha means big or great. Vakya means statement. It's a big statement. By what do I mean by a big statement? It's a statement of what? Who you are. Our whole scripture is not full of Mahavakyas. There's two kinds of Vakyas, Avantara Vakya and Mahavakya. Mahavakyas, Avantara Vakya are, are indirect knowledge and, and prepare the mind for understanding. But Mahavakyas deliver the knowledge. So the Gita set up is based upon each chapter represents one word in that Mahavakya. Tat, Tat means what? Ishwara. Tat, Ishwara. Twam, what's Twam? You, Jiva. Okay, got two bits. Asi, Asi means what? R. That awareness, you, the person, is. You are that, or I, meaning this, I, this jiva I, is that, what? That limitless consciousness, that Brahman, that limitless awareness. So this is just a statement of identity. It's a direct statement. And each chapter deals with one of those factors. The first, the first six chapters deals with what? Twam, you. That's the jiva. And it's getting very clear what jiva has to do here. Huh? <laughs> He's not talking much about Ishwara here. He mentions, mentions it. But basically the whole topic here in the, in the first six chapters are jiva. And what is he saying about the jiva? You need to be qualified. You need to have self-confidence. 
and you need to do effort. <laughs> what do you think? This is why we're. This is why we we just don't agree with the neo Advaita teachings, because the neo Advaita teachings said you don't have to do anything. They say you can't do anything, and you don't have to do anything. Why they say, why do they say you can't do anything? They say because your awareness you can't do anything. Well, that's true, but is that helpful to a jiva? Huh? Is that a helpful statement? That is a terribly frustrating statement, isn't it? <laughs> that doesn't help you at all. All it does is cause frustration. No wonder people get fed up with the neo teachings, the satsangis, and all those people. Because what are they doing? They're immediately throwing away all of the power that they have. What? They're denying their power to act, to, to think, to create, to do. They're saying you can't do anything. So what's the... This is Ramesh and those people, huh? You're not the doer. Well, that's right from this point of view, isn't it? Let's see, let me turn this on a little bit. I see the computer light's going to go back. Anyways. Huh? Is it time to quit? No. Oh. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I want to keep going. No, no. <laughs> you can go. Look at that. Yeah, no, you're right. It's we got to quit. I'm on the clock. Just when it's fun, too. Murti, Veda Murti, you're a mean person. <laughs> <laughs> what was it? Let me just say, what was, what was I saying? Huh? No, yes. Oh, yeah, Tatumasi. Let me just finish this idea and then we'll go. So, Tat means that. You means the jiva. And R is what? The identity between the jiva and Ishwara. Is, is means it's an identity statement. So it's a Mahavakya. It's a proclamation of identity. A, a, a statement of fact. This is a statement of fact. Statements of fact like the ceiling is white. Okay, that's a statement of fact. The ceiling is white. Now, what can you do about the ceiling is white? Nothing. <laughs> you either understand that the ceiling is white, or you don't. If you don't see a white ceiling, then you need to what? You need to get your eyes fixed, or you need to get your brain fixed, because those are the only two things that are in between you and understanding that the ceiling is white. you got cataracts on your eyes, and it looks some other color, or your brain is somewhere else, and you're not <coughs> seeing what's there. Because those are the only two things you need to see that the ceiling is white. So the, the statement is, you are that. You are limitless, ordinary, actionless, non-dual awareness. Now, we have just, we've all, so what? We've covered the first section, which is Twum. Now we're going to talk about that, Ishwara. Okay? So the next six chapters deal with Ishwara, and the third is to help, help us see the identity between the two. And we need to do this because we've assumed now that the jiva, that you, the seeker, the inquirer, is on board. You're ready to do the work. You're committed. You know what the work is to be done. You got your karma yoga, you got your meditation practice, you're doing your sadhana as best you can, you're you're good to go. And you're you're you've taken responsibility for your spiritual growth. You have oh no, I don't have to do anything. There's no doer. No. If you think like that, this you're not gonna get anywhere because you have to do something. That's what we're saying. <laughs> You have to do something. If you don't, you won't get anywhere. You, if you don't do action, you won't get any result. 
<laughs> That's all. To get a result, you have to do action. The action is what? Is to purify your mind. And the second action is what? To practice meditation, practice knowledge. So the second chapter is, and, and how do you do that? You contemplate on Ishwara, on, on the self in form. Because you want what? You want to include Ishwara in your sadhana, in your life. <laughs> Here's the biggest factor in your life, which is Ishwara in the form of your environment. Now, obviously, it's not the pure Ishwara, it's Ishwara in the form. But how far is the form from the formless? How far is the reflection from the mirror? Huh? Zero. Zero. How far is the <coughs> table from the... No, oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> the chair from the wood. There's no difference. So we're go in this chapter, it's called the Upasana section. It's about your relation. It's about meditating on Ishwara. And so we have to know what Ishwara is to meditate on Ishwara. <coughs> so the next six chapters deal with the topic of Tat, Ishwara. And we will uh, begin that teaching uh, this evening at 7 p.m. approximately. <laughs> Thank you for listening to the talk of James Wards on the Bhagavad Gita, recorded at Yoga Vidya Bad Meinberg near Hanover in Germany. More information on shiningworld.com and yoga-vidya.org.